If you're thinking about converting to Islam, it might be because of what you've been told about the Quran. The Quran is the center of Muslim faith, as well as the center of some very compelling lies that Muslim authorities have spread quite successfully in recent decades. So the Caliph Uthman standardized the copies of the Quran, and therefore, from his time up until our time, there has never been two copies of the Quran that are different even in one letter or one word. Since Uthman's time in the mid-7th century, no two Qurans have differed from each other by as much as even a letter. Now, first of all, that's a rather difficult claim to prove since we don't have any Qurans from Uthman's time to compare to. Muslim scholars have called this one of the greatest weaknesses of the Islamic world. And in the existing manuscripts of the Quran we do have, we see numerous textual variations, as well as erasures, tapings, and other forms of correction. So if we don't have any complete Qurans from Uthman's time, and if we observe variants and corrections in the manuscripts we do have, just like any other manuscripts preserved by hand copying, why do we hear claims like this? From his time up until our time, there has never been two copies of the Quran that are different even in one letter or one word. The idea is to convince you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved to the letter. This could only be accomplished by God. Therefore, the Quran's very own preservation is proof that it's a divine book. The only problem is that claim is a lie. Unfortunately, it's been a very popular lie in the Muslim world. Let's look at another lie. This is the origin of the different recitations of the Quran. It all goes back to the Prophet ﷺ asking Jibreel allowance from Allah to recite the Quran in different ways. That's the claim. The Quran is a recitation and there are various equal recitations and they all go back to Muhammad from Allah. But when we look at the Muslim sources, we see something very strange. Muhammad tells his followers to learn the Quran from several people, including Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ubay ibn Qab. Keep in mind, what Muslims claim today is that what they recite goes right back to the time of Muhammad and the companions. However, Muslim sources actually record people like Ibn Shanabuth, who was tried, flogged, and forced to recant his readings, which are precisely some of the same ones Muhammad said to use. But there's more than just this one single case. We also find that the text of the Quran around the 10th century AD could no longer sustain the readings of the much earlier companions so they had to be discarded. Consequently, Al-Tabari reasoned, we are forced to reject the readings which disagree with the Razum, the consonantal skeleton, of our current codices, even if the sound historical accounts unequivocally establish that the companions used to read them differently. Obviously, claims about preserving the early recitations of the Quran from the time of Muhammad and his companions are a later development. Another later development is the concept of canonical divine readings, meaning entire readings of the Quran that are all equally valid and of divine origin from Allah through Muhammad. In reality, dozens upon dozens of different readings of the Quran were circulating in the centuries after Muhammad. About 300 years after Muhammad's death, Ibn Mujahid limited these readings. Each reading was named after the reader himself. There were seven eponymous readers. In spite of these controls, variant Quranic readings began multiplying through their students. So the number of their students had to be limited as well. But as the theologians become more influential, these canonical readings suddenly become divine. Early Muslim scholars did not look at the variant readings of the Quran as divine revelation. This position changed drastically in the later periods especially after the 11th century, where the canonical readings started to be treated as divine revelation. That is, every single variant reading in the seven and ten eponymous readings was revealed by God to Muhammad. But apart from the variant readings of the Quran and its manuscripts, what about its content? Something very strange is that the Quran knows of several books, but speaks primarily of the Torah and Gospel, which it says it confirms. However, when we look at the Qur'an's use of these books, it appears that the author of the Qur'an did not know the difference between them and the later traditions that grew out of them. For example, in the well-known story of Noah's flood, the Qur'an mixes in a detail from much later Jewish tradition about the boiling flood waters. Or when the Qur'an is describing the story of the golden calf, 
It mixes in an ancient legend about harnessing the power of something with the dust of its footprint. In the Quran's account of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, it adds details that come from a water test applied to Jewish mystics who reach the heavenly palace. The Quran borrows from legends about Solomon and his demons that he gets to die for his treasures and build his temple, as well as adapting a legend from the Talmud about Ashmedai, the king of the demons. The Quran also contains numerous repetitions of other legends, like the angels being told to bow down before Adam. This is all very strange for a book that claims to affirm the Torah and not all of the later literature that was developed from it. When it comes to the gospel, the Quran actually contradicts the New Testament while it borrows from stories written much later. This is why we see the Quran repeating strange stories about Mary living in the temple, Jesus speaking from his cradle or making birds out of clay. But aside from the text, variant readings, and content of the Quran, Muslims claim that the Quran's divine origin is apparent if read in Arabic. However, computer analysis has shown that the same basic compositional structure that we find in oral performances like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are at work in the Quran as well. Only about a minimum of 20% oral formulaic density is required to prove a text originated according to these oral compositional devices. This analysis can be conducted with a variety of root sequences of differing lengths, which will of course give different densities. Looking at a simple example of a three-base sequence, the Quran comes in at an astounding 39% average oral formulaic density for the Meccan surahs and 55% for the Medinan surahs. If we push the analysis a bit further, looking for three base sequences that occur five times, the entire Quran averages an impressive 21.86%. This means that the Quran is structured like we would expect for something originating in an oral culture. It's also the best explanation for the Quran's repetition and frequent mixing and matching of its sources. The proclaimer of the Quran's surahs was simply unaware of the actual content of the books that he claimed to confirm. But perhaps most troubling about the Quran is its God. The Quran becomes increasingly violent. It commands Muslims to fight people for lacking belief, even if that lack of belief is expressed in simply voicing disagreement with the Quran's theology. The Quran can only see the former scriptures, including the peaceful teachings of Jesus, as a divine promise to fight and be rewarded by Allah. The Quran tells Muslims that fighting is good for them, and Allah uses violence to soothe the hearts of the believers. This is Allah's destiny for believers, in whose souls he has instilled depravity. But it's only in the afterlife, a place completely constructed by Allah, that we get to see his true character. Allah is very concerned for the men of paradise. They are assured that there will be virgins waiting for them who have eyes only for them. The women will be physically appealing with large breasts. These women will be confined in their tents, waiting for the men to come visit them. In fact, in a lengthy description of paradise in Surah 55, Allah lays out his eternal plan for Muslim men in increasing detail. The women's beauty and virginity is stressed, as is their ready availability for the men. One can imagine the original male audience of this surah being delighted in hearing these words, while the women wonder why their function in paradise is to serve the fantasies of lustful men. In this video, I've talked about the text of the Quran, its variant readings, its content, its supposed divine origin, and its God. But if you're still thinking about converting, maybe that's because you've been told that there were other good reasons to believe in Islam. If that's the case, you'll definitely want to check out this video by David Wood, where he shows what happens when you take a closer look at other so-called evidence for Islam.